Hello, my name is Brady Holtman. I'm an application engineer with Parker Lord. And today we're going to discuss the application of Chemlock 8566. Chemlock 8566 is a one coat aqueous adhesive that can be used without a primer. It gives excellent uh, environmental resistance without the need of a primer. However, there are going to be certain applications where the need of a primer for extra protection is necessary. Uh, the solids levels is 35% solid, so it achieves film very well. Uh, recommended dry film thickness for this material is between 0.5 to 1.0 mils of material. Recommended curing temperature is above 140 degrees Celsius. And once again, the addition of a primer, one of our aqueous primers will help in certain applications and testing will be needed by our customers. Okay, we're gonna get into the proper storage and handling of the Chemlock 8566. And this can also be taken to be used with our other Chemlock aqueous adhesives as well. So the recommended use of our materials for storage is you know, keeping it well organized with the legible labels for your operators to make sure that they're getting the right materials for the jobs that they're working on. We'd like to use the FIFO or first in first out rotation for our materials. So making sure that we're using fresh material for each time that the material is being used in production. It's important to monitor the shelf life of our materials. The shelf life of the aqueous materials is shorter than that of the solvent-based materials. So this has to be um, taken into account when you're storage, storage and handling our materials. Shelf lives of these materials are anywhere for between three and six months. Also, it should be noted to avoid extreme heat or cold because this can affect the stability and performance of our materials. Like with any one of our, our Chemlock products, it's best to seal that material is not in use to prevent evaporation and any potential contamination. And spill containment should be available for, to prevent any potential accidents. So for the handling recommendations for the Chemlock 8566, absolutely, we do not want this material to freeze. So when you're ordering the material, the over-the-road shipments should be uh, sent early in the week during our cold winter months. This material, along with our other aqueous materials, should not be shaken or sheared prior to use. If you do shake the material, you're going to produce a foam that will not reincorporate and the material will not be available for use. Avoid dilution if possible, but if dilution is necessary for a certain type of application, we recommend the use of distilled or deionized water only for the dilution due to various chemicals that may be in the city water that is supplying your facilities. For cleanup of the material, the wet material can be cleaned up with warm water and detergent before it dries. Cured product films must be removed with mechanical abrasion. Excess dry materials can auto ignite above 112 degrees Celsius. So when you are cleaning materials up, the dried chemlock is important to use non-sparking tools when you're doing this application. Utilize common sense and good housekeeping techniques in your facility. Equipment processes and operator training are all valuable parts of the program to ensure that you achieve good bonds with our materials. The key ingredients in chemlock adhesives are similar to those in the solvent-based adhesives. Dispose of these dried residue as you would with any solvent-based materials. Keep your booth filters clean to prevent large buildup of materials to occur. Do not expose dried adhesives to sparks or excessive heat. If scraping the dry adhesives, once again, use a non-sparking made tool and avoid frictional heat from impact or cutting as this can auto-ignite the material. Now we're gonna get into the processing of the Chemlock 8566. Since water is the carrier for the adhesive, it cannot tolerate contaminants on the substrates. Once again, this is very similar to our solvent-based materials. We need a good foundation to have the Chemlock 8566 bond to. So we need a good substrate either mechanical through via uh, grit blasting or chemical as in uh, zinc phosphatizing or zinc nickel. Application preferences, we recommend the use, the use of spray depending on the geometry of the part. Dip and brush can all be used with Chemlock 8566 successfully. Preheating of the substrates is a really good way to improve the wetting and the evaporation of the water off the parts. And it also reduces the time from coating to molding. Time and temperature of drying depend on the mass of the part and the oven for efficiency and design. We do not recommend the use of an IR oven due to hot spots that could auto ignite the dried chemlock residue that is left on the fixturing. We wanna make sure that we have no blisters or bubbles of the coating 
which is showing us we have poor drying. Post-baking primer prior to top coat is suggested. If we're using a primer with the Chemlock 8566, this should be several minutes at 65 degrees C to reduce water entrapment. Mold cures should be a minimum of 155 degrees Celsius for the Chemlock 8566. We we'll talk about the equipment that we're using with the 8566 or any of the Chemlock aqueous materials. Any component of the equipment that is in contact with the wetted material must be made out of stainless steel or engineered plastics. The use of a hydrometer, a plastic hydrometer, for testing of the adhesive solids with a range of 1 to 1.2 grams per milliliter range. When we talk about the use of the Chemlock 8566, or once again, any of our aqueous materials, the use of an inline fluid filter is recommended to catch particles. And we wanna see this in the range of 300 microns or 50 mesh. The aqueous material, unlike the solvent, the dried Chemlock will not reincorporate if it falls into the uh, wet solution. Whereas in the solvent materials, when a material falls in, it'll reincorporate. So we need to stop that material from getting to our spray guns and clogging. Also, if you pre-filter the material, before, when you're putting it into the pressure pot, it'll also help uh, reduce clogging of this inline filter and keep production going. As with any of our Chemlock adhesives, we need to make sure that we get the material off the bottom of the container, making sure we get all those uh, ingredients incorporated properly. We want to avoid uh, sharp edge mixers that would shear the product. We want to use it, um, the one diagram is a jiffy mixer. What that does is incorporates, um, mixes the material very well, but does not incorporate air into it. So we don't have to, doesn't have a vortex when we're mixing the material. And once again, when we're not using the material, seal, seal that container up. And if you take anything away from this, never ever shake our Chemlock aqueous materials, or you just, you're going to introduce a great amount of foam and have to dispose of the product. What we're showing here is a typical Chemlock drum setup. We have our incoming air source, which is going to our air agitators. On the diagram, you'll see a ground bus bar and a grounding strap. We're showing the grounding strap just for good uh, housekeeping if the customer is also using the 8566 with a solvent-based material. And we're showing the two-inch valve on the base of the drum for dispensing the material. This can be, will be made out of brass or plastic and into a five gallon pail or a pressure pot if you're feeding it through that way. And also we show the containment area in case there were any spills that would happen in this, in this operation. Typical mixing guidelines for our materials, uh, for a half pint, just a hand stir to get the material off, the, sweep the material off the bottom. And then, a, you know, about a five minute mix time to get that material all incorporated. For a one gallon container, once again, we're going to hand stir that material and then mix it for a duration of about 15 minutes by hand. For five gallons, hand stir to break the material off the bottom. And then in the previous slide, you saw the Jiffy mixer with an air powered mixer, about a 30 minute uh, window for mixing that material and getting everything in suspension. For the 55 gallon drum, our drums come with a built in agitator. So the first thing that our customer will do is hand crank the agitator sweeping the material off the bottom. And then once the material is in suspension, put an air driven agitator on it for a minimum of eight hours. And once you start mixing the material, you're gonna continue mixing that drum until the material is completely gone. In the aqueous material, we want a, a, a rotational speed of about 20 to 30 RPMs to make sure we get everything incorporated. Okay, recommended dry film thicknesses. And this is, is key to the use of all of our materials. We need to have the right amount of dry film thickness amount of curative to grab to the elastomers. So the recommended thicknesses are between 0.5 and 1 mil. And what we see is if they don't have enough of the, of the dry film thickness, the material is too thin, we have lack of solids to create the bond. And generally these are less than 0.5 mils of total dry film thickness. And this is a common problem that we see in application engineering from customers when we receive failed parts back from them. If the material is on too thick and what will happen is the adhesive will fail cohesively within it itself. And generally this is above two mils of total dry film thickness. We're gonna talk about handling of coated parts. And this also applies to handling parts prior to the Chemlock application. So when we're handling parts, we wanna have gloves to minimize contamination. We wanna store the parts in clean containers covered. So we, any uh, contamination airborne that may be in a facility doesn't get onto the parts. 
and we want to minimize how much the parts are, are, are bumping or in the container that they're being put into prior to going to the press. This is, falls under the same in first in, first out to the press. Labor for this material is typically 30 days. So if the material is in a, a container covered from contamination. We should be able to achieve good bond up to 30 days. We're going to get into the application of the Chemlock 8566. Okay, like I said, a preferred method for application is the use of spray. And it's very important that the incoming air source is clean of oil and water that is comes from the compressor. So we like to see an oil water extractor at the point of use. So at the spray booth, we like to see an oil water extractor. And when you're looking at the oil and water extractor, you want to see a, a inspection schedule. They're opening the, the valve on there to make sure that the material is clean air coming out of there and that the cartridge that is catching those materials isn't clogged and need to be replaced. And a good quick way to verify this is to trigger your gun onto a piece of glass or a clean mirror and look for any particulate residue coming out of your air source. Gun maintenance is also a crucial thing. Inspect for wear, for damage. Make sure that using the proper wrenches when you're working with the guns. Uh, the right type of um, needle lube to make sure that the gun is actuating properly. And extra guns to rebuild kits so we don't have production line uh, shutting down. At the end of the day, when they, their, their production is done, we want to reduce plugging and promote that gun life. We want to flush out that gun, and I'll have a slide following that shows a very simple way to ensure that every time that we start production with this material, their gun is clean, the lines are clean, and we're ready to run. When we look at these areas where we're applying our materials, we want it to be a well-lit area so the operators can inspect where the proper adhesive coverage is going onto the part. We like to see um, clean filters. And we want to make sure because if the filters are dirty, they're going to blow back on the equipment and clogging issues could potentially happen with the gun. And once again, just good housekeeping in, the, in that area. Make sure that the booths are all in working condition. The conveyors, the ovens are calibrated in the timers. Make sure all the sensors are working properly. We want the first part coming off the line to be the same as the part after an eight hour shift. For application for the fastest, most consistent method, spray application is the most desired. The oil and water extractor, as you see on the right, we want to make sure that we have the gauges are clean, that they're easily to, to read. Any areas where we don't want to have our adhesive, making sure that the masking is um, designed to prevent overspray onto a component. We do not recommend the use of an airless system to apply our materials. The piston pumps used in these types of equipment can cause unwanted shear on, their, on our materials. Here's a very simple diagram of an automatic spray gun with a stainless steel pressure pot. It shows the placement of a 50 mesh inline filter. And what you see on the far right is a small pressure pot with deionized water in it. So at the end of the shift, when they're done running for the day, there's a three-way valve that you um, implement, and that will push the deionized water through the system to the gun and then that gun will be ready to go for the next day's operation. So the next day's operation, all I need to do is throw that three valve again and push the adhesive through the system and they're up and ready to go. It's a very simple uh, way to ensure that the gun is clean and ready to go at the end of the day. What we're showing here is just your, your typical chain on edge line for applying our materials. This is a single booth unit, which we can use for the Chemlock 8566. What we're showing here is this is a typical automotive pin or an industrial pin. And if you notice the spray pattern is exceeding past the end of the tube, what that is doing, we're making sure that we have a very uniform coating across that whole part. A lot of times what we will see from parts coming into us for analysis is we'll see lighter um, dry film thicknesses on the end. And unfortunately, this is the area where that part is exposed to the environments. So what you're seeing here is um, just a you have to exceed the part, and because of the ellipse of the spray, we want to have uniform coating thickness across that whole component. Okay, we're going to get into dip applications. So dip can be done either by hand or an automated line. Conveyor systems provide the higher outputs with line speeds of one to two meters per minute. Remember that dipping is going to coat the entire surface. So film thickness can vary from the top to the bottom of the component. That's why we need a slow withdrawal rate. 
One meter per minute is suggested to have a consistent film on the part from top to bottom. When we talk about the design of the dip tank, agitation is necessary to keep all the solids in suspension. This can be done by paddles and recirculation lines using a double diaphragm pump, which is recommended. If the part comes out of the dip tank and has uh, droplets on it, we can remove these droplets by the use of an air knife immediately after it exits the tank just to knock off any tears that are coming off with the components. There are certain parts that will have puddling on them. What we have done in the past is work with the engineer who designed any new components to see if they have any issues adding an engineering hole to allow the material to drain out of the part. When we're not using the tank, it falls right back to what we talked about earlier with the smaller container size. Um, we wanna cover that tank with a gasketed lid to minimize water loss. If there is a big gradient in temperature in the facilities, sometimes the use of a heat exchanger will be need to maintain the consistent temperature of that tank. And what that is doing is it's keeping the stability and our film thickness equal, regardless of the temperature that's uh, inside the facility. We monitor the viscosity of the material with a hydrometer, adding water or adhesive as needed. You can also use a small test panel to run through the system first, dry it, and use that to measure your film thicknesses. Talk about transfer efficiency, between 25 and 75% of the transfer efficiency with your dip tank. And this depends on the equipment design, part configuration, and the efficiency of the drag out and recovery that you use in your tanks. This is just a, a typical automated dip line. The one thing that I will point out is that overflow weir on the right side. You want to keep the level in your overflow weir very close to the top where the material is coming in to prevent the, the foaming issue that we discussed earlier. So if the material comes in and drops a great distance, we have the potential to introduce foam into the solutions. And even on this tank too, we are gonna have a 50 mesh inline filter to catch any particulates that may be dried and then floating through the tank. In summary for the Chemlock 8566, and once again, this falls to all of our Chemlock materials. We need proper metal preparation parameters. We need a clean working surface for our materials to grab to. Proper handling and mixing and storage of our materials is uh, crucial with these materials. Constant application of the targeted dry film thickness. If we don't have the right amount of material on the part, we are potentially going to see bonding problems. And this is where training and QCing of the materials as it's being used has to be maintained. Proper drying and coating of the parts for storage so we get no contamination prior to molding. And once again, Process control equals low scrap. We want to see a process and control, and we'll get good bonded parts off the lines. At this time, we're going to open up to any questions that you may have. Thank you for your attention.